open it to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to be reading out of verse 18. And if I could put a title on the message this morning, it would be, Where's the church? Where is the church? Hallelujah. Lord, this morning, guide me and lead me to speak what you want me to say. No more and no less, Lord. Your people and myself, Lord included, come not just to hear from a man's opinion, but to hear what the Word of God says. Speak to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Matthew 16, 18, and I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible, 1995. I say, also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. And I want to put emphasis on that, uh, on a few words in here. One of them is, I, I will build my church. And the other, and, and the other word is church. Because the question is, where is the church? Uh, and then finally, the gates of hell will not overpower it. Some versions say will not prevail against it. Uh, so that's where I want to go. Talking about uh, what is a church? What is the reason and the purpose of church? I, I did a little, a, a little study, and, and this is just our denomination here, the Assemblies of God. If, if you don't know anything about the denomination you're in, it would be a good thing to find out, even the most basic stuff. Find out what church you're going to, <laughs> what denomination you're attending. It's not the most important thing, but it is important that you understand uh, uh, that, you know, at least know the church you're going to. The Assemblies of God is the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world. Uh, there's other uh, Pentecostal denominations, Church of God, uh, the Apostolic Church, uh, and a few other smaller ones. But the Assemblies of God is the largest. It was started in 1914 in, uh, in Arkansas, Hot Springs, Arkansas. And uh, it was 300 ministers that came together. They had experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost. A lot of them at Azusa Street in, in Los Angeles. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Revival broke out in different places. And it was a moving of, of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. People were getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's what makes us different. We, we're evangelical. We're Christian. Uh, but we have a distinctive. And that's that distinctive is we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence, the initial physical evidence, and I put emphasis the initial, the, not the only, but the initial, the first physical evidence is speaking in tongues. And these people were on fire for God. They had been filled with the power of God, and some of their churches didn't believe in that. There were different mainline churches, and, and they started to have problems, and some were kicked out, and some of them wound up having to leave their churches and they got together and they formed a fellowship called the Assemblies of God. Started with 300 ministers getting together. Assemblies of God has over, uh, over around 6 million people now all over the world. Here in the United States it's about 2 million and there are churches from one side of the United States to the other. It's the largest Pentecostal denomination started in 1914. This church here I discovered a paper, and Sister Marilyn, I've got to get together with you. Sister Marilyn knows probably more history than anyone on this church. I don't know, uh, but I want to pick your brain. And, oh, and friends. That, okay, well, maybe you can, we can all three sit down, have a cup of coffee, and I can pick you guys' brain and ask you a lot of questions on the history of this church. But jo Reverend John Eiking, spelled E-I-G-T-I-N-G, uh, was the one that started this church and he was a 
pioneer church planter, did you know that there's over 200, uh, I believe there's over 200 churches in Arizona of the Assemblies of God. And the first church uh, in the whole state of Arizona, the first Assembly of God, you want to take a guess where it was? Yeah, of course, you had to know. Bisbee, Arizona was the first assembly of God. And guess who started it? The same man that started this church. Yeah. Reverend John Eichen. In 1912, 13, around that circa that year he started. That's even before the Assemblies of God was formed. And then in 1917, he organized it as an Assembly of God church. That was only three years after the Assemblies of God was three years old. And then in 1919, he came here to Douglas. And in January of 1919, he started having services in a home. And he started gathering people and it began to grow. And in March 11 of 1919, he uh, organized it as an Assembly of God church. And it joined the General Council of Assemblies of God. So our birthday is coming up here in, uh, in March 11th. So we're going to be 103 years old. Wow, no wonder my bones feel a little creaky. <laughs> this church has been around a long time. This church is the second oldest church in the whole state of Arizona of the Assemblies of God. And Brother Iting went on to plant three more churches in Phoenix and in Tucson. Uh, and he was just a church planter and he moved around quite a bit. I've got a historical paper, it's kind of rough, some of the, the, the letter, the writing is hard to understand. But man, I, I love history and it, it, you know, we, we, we forget these things. We just come to church and we think, well, this is, all I know is here, what's here, Pastor Pete and maybe two or three pastors before him. And that's it. Some people. Now, Sister Marilyn goes back to what? Brother Green, when you came here, Sister? Before yeah, him. even before him. Who was the pastor before him? Uh, I met him in Tucson. Yeah, it was amazing. At, at a, at a, I think it was Wow. Uh, a lot of history here. So I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders and the foundation of many other pastors. And as I read about Brother John Eitin, there's been some amazing pastors here before me. I'm just one of many pastors that have pastored here since 1919. A long succession of pastors. And some of them amazing, amazing men of God. And it's been, it's been amazing. So, what do we think of when we hear the, the word uh, church? Uh, what do we think of when we think of the word church? There, usually, uh, we think uh, of religious people uh, or that go somewhere uh, into a building. We think of a building or we think of a denomination. And, and sometimes we hear in the news, well, the church is opposed to this or a church is opposed to that. And we think of religious people or we think, uh, like I said, of a denomination or a building. But a church is much more than that. Uh, I think that to understand, uh, to be able to understand the reason of the purpose of the church, we first have to understand what the church is. So I want to define that. I know I've been talking about the history of this church uh, in, the, in the sense of a, of, of a congregation, of a, of a group of believers that came together. But let me go a little bit deeper into that. Uh, how, we, first, we must define what the church is in order to understand the reason and the purpose of the church. How can we be the church? And this is what the church really is. Uh, the church is all born again believers. People who have put their trust in Jesus as their personal Savior and are following Jesus by obeying His Word. Uh, the, the, this building becomes, I think it's more appropriate to say congregation than church. But 
This building, we can more accurately call it a church when we come here only, only when born again believers and followers of Jesus Christ walk in and are part of this congregation, then we can call it a church. Because we don't just come to church, but in a certain way, we don't just go to church, but we bring the church. So, so when, when I come in here and this building is empty, in my mind, it's still not a church until you walk in. And, and we all walk in and we all gather and we're all believers. Those of us that are believers in Jesus Christ, obviously we have visitors and some may not be uh, believers in Jesus Christ. But those that are believers, that's what makes the church, the body of believers, a family of God that comes in. So we are the church. Everyone that has been saved and given their life to Jesus automatically becomes a member of the church. And we think, but well, I didn't sign a paper to become a member of the church. Not this church, but the church, the body of Christ all over the world of different nationalities. But one thing unites them, and that's the fact that they've trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The church was born on the day of Pentecost. Before the day of Pentecost, in the book of Acts, there was no church. There was only uh, the people of Israel, the, the Jews, and the proselytes, people that had joined themselves, they were called God-fearers. They were not Jews, but they believed in the God of the Jews. And they were proselytes. They were Gentiles that had joined the Jews. But they were never considered full-fledged members of the family of God. They were like the stepchild, <laughs> the adopted ones, the half-brothers maybe. But only the Jews were the people of God in the Old Testament. Uh, now... Jews and all Gentiles, after the day of Pentecost, all Gentiles and all the Jews, together in Christ. This is called the mystery of God. Paul calls it that, become the people of God. So the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles and people all over the world that come and in Jesus Christ we are reconciled to God and reconciled and made one family. And that is what the church is. So the, the church doesn't even need a building, really, to be honest with you. It's just the group of people. In fact, the word, uh, the Greek word for church is ecclesia, E-C-C-L-E-S-A. -E uh, I believe it's one or two S's, I-A. And it simply means the called out ones. But in the church, uh, the early church, they, they use it in reference called out from the world and made holy, separated from the world for God. The called out ones from the world to serve God. That was what the church was. So it's important that we understand that. You are part of the church the day you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Whether you're a member of this church or any church or not a member anywhere. You are part of the church of God. Now, uh, I think that it is important to also understand this. It may be kind of like a, a small detail, but I feel it is important that one person alone is not the church of God. But the church of God is made up of believers. That's why it comes from that Greek word ecclesia, which means the called out ones, plural. The called out group of people that come together and assemble. Uh, and that's very important to remember because sometimes people feel, well, I'm saved. I love God. I don't need anyone. It's just me and Jesus. And we got our own thing going on. And we don't need anybody else. We're just here on our own. That's not the church. The church is believers coming together. Again, it's not the building. It's not the denomination. But it is a group of believers forming the body of Christ. And there's believers all over the world. There's been believers of all time. Some have already passed away and they're in the grave waiting for that day that the trumpet sounds. They're all part of the church of God. 
So that is something to keep in mind. So what is the reason and the purpose of the church now that we're saved? Now that we're part of the church? So is it just to come and, 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 uh, and see each other? Is it just to try our best to, uh, you know, uh, do what's right and not get into any trouble and, uh, and, and be good people until the day we die? Or the Lord comes. Is that what the church is? The reason and the purpose. There is a reason and a purpose for a church. And I'd like to speak a little bit on that. There is a threefold purpose of the church. Why the church exists. Number one. And I want you to look at Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. The very first reason of the church. If you could have a triangle in your mind. And I wish I had put this in a PowerPoint presentation. It would be a triangle with three points. And in each side, three sides. The first side would be evangelism. And, and then I'll, I'll get to the other two sides. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. That is what is known as the Great Commission. The first purpose and reason of the church is evangelization. We are known and referred to in the Bible as the body of Christ. When Christ came first to this earth, how did he come? How did, how, did, how did he come to this earth the first time? We celebrate it in Christmas. What is it? The birth. It's in the form of a little baby that grew up and then became a man, the man Christ Jesus. And that was God with us, Emmanuel. Uh, all the fullness of the Godhead was in him as he came to this earth. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So in a sense, he took a body so that he could come and preach the gospel of good news and then so he could pay for the price of our sins on the cross of Calvary. And now he went back up to heaven and he said, I go but I will send you a comforter. He sent the Holy Spirit. And what is the body of the Holy Spirit? The we can't see the Holy Spirit. We can't touch the Holy Spirit. So how do we know the Holy Spirit is on earth? The Holy Spirit's body is the church. The Bible calls the church the body of Christ. Christ inhabits the church through the Holy Spirit. And that's his body here on earth to carry out the great commission so that we become the hands of God, the feet of God, the voice of God, the eyes of God, the heart of God to a world that is lost and doesn't know the Lord just as Jesus came and preached the good news. That's why Jesus said as the Father has sent me now I send you. We're the body of Christ. That is uh, one of the main purposes and reason of the church evangelism. This should be every believer's desire and in every church's mission statement, the winning of souls. Now I realize that when we talk about uh, evangelism and soul winning, people get nervous because not very many people participate in soul winning. And, and, and it's because sometimes we, we think, well, I have to do it a certain way and I can't do it that way. It's not my personality. I struggle, so I don't do anything. And because I'm so afraid, I just stay stuck here and I stay here. Well, I want to tell you, the methods may differ. There are many different ways of evangelism. There's friendship evangelism. There's mission trips. Yes, there's door-to-door -door evangelism. There's outdoor ministry. But there's other forms. Even mission giving. Did you know we support missionaries? As you walk out the door and you turn to your uh, left, there's certificates of missionaries that we support. As you give to support those missionaries, you're having a part in evangelizing the world because that's what they're doing. We can't go to those parts of the world where they're at, but we're sending them. They're our voice. So that's a form of uh, all these are ways to fulfill the Great Commission. Don't condemn yourself because you're not doing all these things. Maybe you're doing it one way. But here is the key. Ask the Lord, first of all, to give you the desire to do something. 
to do something to win people for Jesus. Your style of winning people to Jesus may be very different than mine. Uh, I like what Ray Comfort said. Ray Comfort is, is with Living Waters, an organization that all they do is so winning. That's all they do. And boy, he is good at it. He's got YouTube videos. I highly recommend that you go on YouTube and type in uh, Living Waters University or type in Ray Comfort and you watch his videos and you will learn how to do so winning. And it is so, so simple how he explains it. Uh, even if it's just your family that you start with. Uh, but he said something that stuck with me. He said some of us are very nervous. We're all very nervous about talking to someone about Jesus. Especially a stranger that we've never met. How do we start a conversation? Uh, but he says... Don't ask the Lord for courage. Don't ask the Lord for boldness. I thought that was interesting. He said, ask the Lord for love. Ask the Lord for love. Let me ask you this question. What makes a mother run inside a burning building, break free from firefighters that are trying to hold her uh, back because her child is in that building? What makes her run in there and risk dying to save her child. What is it? What is it? Is it that she's courageous? Is it that she's strong? What is it that makes her go in there to save her child? Love. Love you got it. I saw a video of, of a bull rider that was, and boy, they are, those, those guys that ride horses and ride bulls, I think they're crazy. It is awful the way those big bulls weigh a lot. They weigh over a ton and they can kill them. And one of those riders was riding and, and I saw the video and, and he, he hit his head because the bull was bucking him so hard. His head went forward. He hit it on a horn of the bull and then knocked him out cold and he fell down and then the bull came back to trample him. The bull was going wild. Out of the blue it seemed like his dad came running because he saw his son wasn't getting up and he ran out there and he saw the bull coming back and he threw himself over his son and he wrapped himself over his son so that if the bull tried to gouge him or throw him it was going to get the father first. He came out alive and they interviewed him and he's he said, I would do anything for my children. I would do anything. Wow, it, it just choked me up. Love is powerful. And Ray Comfort says, don't ask God to make you bold or to make you brave or courageous to speak to someone about God. Ask him to give you love. Because when he gives you love, you see people that are hurting and dying and going to hell. And it breaks your heart and you feel you just got to do something. Not because you have to earn brownie points with God. Not because the church told you to do it. Not because it's your religious duty. But because you love you love. Evangelism is so important. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Again Jesus is speaking and this is what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the most remotest parts of the earth. That's when the church was born. On the day of Pentecost. That's when the church started. And he said, you will be my witnesses. So that was the first commit. That was the first reason and purpose of the church. We are saved not to be put on display or to be kept safe. Because a lot of people think, okay, now I'm saved. Now I'm just waiting to go to heaven. God help me to hang on until to go to heaven. God say, no, I saved you so that you could be my hands and my arms to a lost world. Again, I say, don't condemn yourself if you, if you can't do evangelism a certain way. Find your way of doing evangelism. Maybe it's just treating someone nice and waiting for that door to open. Maybe it's just mentioning the word, uh, mentioning the love of God to someone that is hurting and, and praying, God, let this open the door so I can witness to them. But have the desire. You know when we're in trouble? 
is when we don't even have the desire, we don't care. We're just, we're just concerned about ourselves making it to heaven and we don't care about anything else. Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. The second reason and purpose of the church is worship. Jeremiah chapter 26 uh, verse 2. Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah who have come to worship in the Lord's house. That's the purpose of the church. And remember, all the church together, all the, 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 the believers and followers of Jesus Christ together form the church. And when we get together, it says, Speak to the cities of Judah who have come to worship in the Lord's house. This building only serves as a place where God's people uh, uh, come to worship the Lord. All the words that I have commanded you to speak to them, do not omit a word. I want you to look at Psalm chapter 5, uh, verse 7. And, and Brother Barajas, I'm not sure if I gave you this scripture. I hope I did, but I noticed I had left it out. Uh, hopefully I did. But as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple I will bow in reverence for you. You see as we come into the house of the Lord that there is a purpose to come in here and that's to bow down. That's a reverence. That's to worship the Lord. It's not just another Sunday. It's not just another service. It's not just me doing my duty and putting in my time. I come in here to worship God. Oh, I would that God's people would feel the presence of God every time they walk into this place. That when they come in, they say, ah, I'm in the house of God. Lord, I'm so glad to be here. I feel your presence already, God. I just want to let go of everything and focus on you and worship you. That is the reason. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 uh, and verse uh, 26 what is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble? Each one has a psalm. Each one has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. We come to worship and build each other up spiritually. Edify one another in the spirit as we come together. Church services are not just a religious duty. This is a difference between church, church churches that are dead and churches that are alive. They are meant to be a time of worship, of praise and rejoicing, encouraging, serving and loving and all those things. The beauty of the building or the skill of the singers and musicians should not in any way take away from that purpose. It doesn't matter if we have a band. I wish we did. I love a band. But if we don't have a band, so be it. It doesn't matter if we can sing so great. Excuse, sorry, Brother Gilbert. We may be totally out of tune and, and sound like a, a cat fighting with a vacuum cleaner, but we're worshiping God. And God says, make a joyful noise. No wonder he said noise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So if it's off key, if it sounds horrible, if it sounds like noise, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But do it for God. This again is what makes a difference between a dead church and an alive church. Wow. Some believers in some countries are so dirt poor they have these shacks that they call churches. Barely tents. And some of them don't even have that. Some of them just meet out there in the woods by a river. And in the open air, in the jungle, in the wood, they worship God and the presence of the Lord is real and powerful among those believers. Because it's not the building, it's not the music, it's not the liturgy, it's not the way things are done. It's the people of God that are there worshiping God. Amen. Psalm 100 tells us our attitude as we come into the house of the Lord. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. 
come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now listen to this carefully. Enter his gates with what? Complaining, dragging our feet, saying, I got to be here. I'd rather not be here. No! Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness for all generations. Come in singing. Come in laughing. Come in praising God. And if someone says, why are you so happy? Tell them because God is here and I came to thank him and I came to praise him. What a difference when we come into the house of God. Like that. Evangelism. Worship. The reason and the purpose of the church. And finally, the third side of the triangle, discipleship. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. For the equipping of the saints... For the work of service. For the building up of the body of Christ. I'm going to read verse 11 because it kind of gives a context. It says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Ministry gifts to the church. God gave these gifts to the church, pastors, evangelists, teachers, prophets. And he says the reason he did it is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. We're meant to grow. Not stay the same. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. The Apostle Paul is speaking on this and he says, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. You see, we're supposed to pass it on. What you learn, pass it on to other faithful people. That they can pass it on to other faithful people. All so that the body can grow up. We will only grow spiritually in proportion to the investment we make into our spiritual life. I want to repeat that again. We will only grow spiritually in proportion to the investment we make into our spiritual life. And that will be affected. The investment we make will be affected by the pri priority that we give to spiritual things. Where is it on your totem pole? Where is it on your priority list, the things of God, such as being in the house of God, getting into the word, praying, and growing spiritually, seeking God? That in turn will be affected, how we set our priority will be affected by desire, appetite, and hunger. We make a high priority only the things that we like the things that we desire those are the things that we give priority I've said it before but I haven't said it in a long time so I'll say it again this morning you will only have as much of God as you want in fact you already do Ooh, that didn't sound nice I know so I'm going to say it again you will only have as much of God as you want. In fact, you already do. If you're not satisfied, if you think you have too little bit of God, then you need to say, God, give me more hunger. Give me an appetite. Give me a stronger desire for the things of God. Can you make somebody eat that doesn't have an appetite? Can you make somebody eat something that is not desirable to them? Here. A nice bowl of freshly made spinach. If you gave me that, I know spinach is delicious, my sister loves it, but for me, you gave me that, there's nothing appetizing for me. How about some liver and onions? Well, some people like liver and onions. But if it's not desirable to you, I don't care if it's steaming, hot, and the people that made it say it is so delicious, you ain't going to touch it. You have to desire it. 
So what's the verdict, Pastor Pete? If I don't have desire and appetite, get on your face before God and cry out and recognize God, unless I have a desire and a hunger, I ain't going to go after it. Give me a hunger, Lord. Give me a desire. Now, while you're praying that prayer, don't expect a, a, a thunder from heaven or a lightning from heaven. That's going to just come and hit you. <laughs> Whoa! I'm hungry for God! Where is the next meeting? Uh, I, can't, I can't have enough church. I'm going to go to every church in the, in the whole city looking for services and reading the Bible. Oh, I just got to read the Bible. What happened? I don't know. Something from heaven just hit me. No, it doesn't usually happen that way. Sometimes some people get blessed so beautifully. They're just worshiping God and crying and they love. But most of the time, you know how it happens? You pray to God to give you desire. And then you go home and you say, I'm going to start by reading at least five verses a day. I set a plan, start small, but I read. Start with an easy book. I recommend John or the book of Romans. And, and start there and start reading. Separate some time. We're doing this in our prayer class that we're doing. In fact, last Wednesday we spent almost half of the class in prayer. That was the class. We're studying on prayer. And I thought, enough studying on prayer. Because we do everything. We study about prayer. We talk about prayer. We read about prayer. We do everything except pray. So I said, let's do something interesting in this class of prayer. Let's pray. <laughs> it's kind of like swimming. I can teach you all about swimming. But if I never throw you in the pool and you don't practice what you... Yes, heard me teach you about swimming, you'll never swim. So we, we spent half the class in prayer, praying. And, and that's what we have to do. We have to say, God, give me the desire, but I'm going to do my part. And you know what? God will honor that kind of prayer. The devil will fight you with everything he's got. Believe me. He will fight you with everything he's got to keep you from doing that. But don't be discouraged and don't give in. We are supposed to not stay spiritual midgets. If you look back a year, two, three years, and you haven't grown very much spiritually, it's time to really go to the Lord and say, God, I, I don't know very much more about the Bible than I knew three or four years ago. I don't feel that much closer to you than I was back then. Under, we're not supposed to stay as midgets, undernourished, and stuck. Look at what 2 Peter 3.18 admonishes. This is the Apostle Peter, and he says these words in 2 Peter Chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to emphasize that again. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, verse 2 of First Peter. Again, Peter is talking and look what he says. Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation grow everybody say that word grow. grow do you like to see your kids grow I mean yeah I remember when they were babies and sometimes we say oh I wish they'd stay as babies all their life but really do you want them to stay as babies all their life 18 years old and they're still kicking on the ground crying because you didn't give them what they wanted or they're walking around Walmart and they can't buy something so they just start throwing a fit? Of course not. <laughs> you want them to grow. You don't want them to stay small. 
We're supposed to grow. And as Christians, we are supposed to grow as well. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 and I'm going to read it out of a different version. This is out of the NET, the New English Testament but you'll probably see it up here in the King James Version and this is what it says. For though you should in fact be teachers by this time you need someone to teach you the beginning elements of God's utterances. Not only have you not grown but you have gone back to needing milk, not solid food. Wow. Paul is concerned. You haven't grown. You should already be teaching others and you're still being taught. Having to be taught the word of God. That is the purpose of the church. Evangelism, we're to get busy reaching the lost world beginning with our families, our friends, loved ones, worship, oh, come into the house of the Lord with thanksgiving, with praise and just worship God and discipleship, learning and growing. This takes a lifetime of just growing in the Lord. It's feeling the presence of the Lord is beautiful, but you better have something to stand on when the enemy attacks you and you don't feel the presence. There's going to be time. You mean Pastor, there's times you don't feel the presence of the Lord? Yep. There's times you pray and you don't even feel like your prayers make it through the ceiling. There's times you feel discouraged. Yes, Christians get discouraged too. And they get down and they feel like quitting. You know what's going to hold you? Your commitment to live for Jesus Christ and the promises found in His Word. Hallelujah. The promises found in His Word. The church started on the day of Pentecost and it has been attacked by the devil since the day it started. But 2,000 years later, the church is still standing. Amen. A lot of the empires that try to stamp it out, including killing so many Christians, are long gone, but the church is still standing. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus gave himself for the church. Jesus loved the church. Jesus purifies the church. And one day, Jesus is coming back for the church, his bride. Wow, that's you and me. That's you and I. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. I need you. You need me. We all need God. And we're all part of the family of God. We start as babies and we're growing up and all the adventures. All the adventures. I sometimes remember, how far back can you remember your life? Uh, I think I stop at about five years old. I don't know if, if some of you have memories so good you remember when you were one or maybe when you were a baby. Does anybody remember being in their mom's stomach? I, I sure <laughs> that's going pretty far back uh, but we've grown look where we are now and we have experiences in life and we're either better or bitter because of it but we're not the same we've grown we've gotten wiser that's why you hear parents telling their kids Listen, I might give you a piece of advice. And just like us, sometimes the kids say, Ah, you just don't understand. You're from another time. This is modern time. And we were the same way as teenagers. But we say that because we've learned something. We've learned something. I told my wife the other day, just yesterday, we were talking about our adult life. And I said, there are some things I would do so much different like in the area of finances. Oh, that I ever get myself stuck in finances. I want to tell you, I paid off all my consumer debt about six months ago, eight months ago, and I was just hallelujah and jumping up and down and feeling great. And I told my wife, if I had, had it all over to do again, I would never get, I would get those credit cards and tear them up. I would, I would think carefully before I bought, can I pay this or not? Oh, but when you're young, you feel you can take on the world. Sure, I can afford this. Sure, I can afford that. 
We learn things as we go. We become wiser. We become better. And hopefully, we become better people with our spouse and even with our kids because we learn. We made mistakes when they were little, but we kind of learned some things along the way. It just makes us a better person. You know what? In the faith, it should be the same way spiritually. That we started rough, we made mistakes, we had crazy beliefs. But as we read the word of God, as we prayed and as we grew in the Lord, we became stronger, we became wiser, we became more fruitful and effective for God. We learned some things. That's a Christian life. Very different from just putting in the time, being a Christian day in and day out. No, it's a journey. It's a growth. It's something beautiful. Let us bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, each one of us that has come to know you as, a, as our personal Savior are part of the body of Christ called the church. And God, some of us started a few years ago, a few months ago, some of us a long time ago. Lord, help us to stop and consider where we are now. Do we understand what it means to be the church? The body of Christ, the family of God. What you want us to do, the reason and the purpose of the church. Oh God, there's people that are lost, relatives, friends. Dear God, give me a love. Give me a love for lost souls. Lord, have I learned what worship is? It's not just singing the same songs over and over. It's stopping Realizing who you are, what you've done for us, it involves gratitude, it involves memory, it involves understanding of who you are, what you've done for us, what you're doing and what you've promised to do, and how unworthy we were when you found us and you, you, you died for us and you forgave us of our sins. And you've, you've kept us up to this day. Some of us have been close to death. Some of us have been deathly sick. Some of, them have, some of us have escaped horrible accidents. We're still here, God. You've been good to us. You blessed us. We're not on the streets. Maybe we're not rich, but we've got what we need. Lord, we have so much to worship you and thank you for. And God, give us an appetite and a hunger forgetting to know you better. Like the Apostle Paul said, that was his, the goal of his life, to know you, to know God, to seek Him, and to grow spiritually in my walk with God so that I can be strong enough to help my brother and my sister in their walk with the Lord. To share with my children, Lord, what God has given me and done for me. To learn the power of prayer and the wisdom of the word. To get it in us, God. To walk close with you every day. Lord, speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Speak to our hearts, dear Lord. Please consider everything that you've heard this morning. I think it's a good practice. Every time we hear the word of God, that when we go home, Find a place, even if it's for five minutes, even if it's for five minutes, can you spare five minutes and just say, God, I want to think about what I heard this morning. Five minutes. Put a timer on if you have to. You know what? If God gets a hold of you, 
timer goes off, you're going to throw it away and you're going to say, I got to spend a little bit more time because this is good. But if you don't feel that way, well, five minutes are up, stop. But consider, consider. Let's pray as we're dismissed. And if you want to come forward, I'm going to be here. I count it a privilege to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone that's come this morning. The church. This is the church, the body of believers. And God, you've, you've got work for us to do. You've got a plan for us as a church. A reason and a purpose for the church. And we're part of it, Lord. Help us to carry it out, Lord. Go with my brothers and sisters that have to leave this morning. Bless them. May we get home and pause and meditate on what we've heard. Lord, for those that are want to stay for a while and come forward for prayer, meet them here, bless them, touch them, minister to them, dear Lord. I pray in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.